the basic physics covered in this course is really consists of only a very small number of fundamental physics principles. And what we mean by a fundamental physics principle is a principle that relates cause and effect and that applies to absolutely everything in the universe as far as we know. So it applies to subatomic particles and applies to galactic clusters. These are very powerful. There are really only three that we'll cover this semester. The first one is the momentum principle. It has to do with momentum and motion of bodies. The energy principle, which has to do with energy, a topic that you know something about. And the angular momentum principle. And combined with some models of the stuff matters made of, atoms, subatomic particles, these principles are powerful enough to let us draw lots of conclusions and make lots of predictions about the way the world works. So that's the game we're going to be playing all semester. Uh, we will get to introduction of momentum on Wednesday and momentum principle next week. What we're going to start with now is a little bit of, of underpinnings that are important for us to be able to apply these principles uh, in a precise way. If we're going to make predictions about how objects in the world are going to move and interact, we need to be able to describe things like where they are and how fast they're going and what direction they're moving in precisely. And we have to be able to do this in three dimensions because the world is three-dimensional. So we're going to be working with three-dimensional vectors, and that's what we're going to be talking about for most of the rest of the period. I'd like to point out that these lectures are being videotaped. You can see the camera up there for use in a, in a possible distance course in the future. Uh, this is unfortunately not your big chance at Hollywood because the only piece of their they're filming the, the lecturer and the screen and the, the, the whiteboard. So at most, the back of your head will appear. So you're, it's not your big Hollywood debut. Um, it would be helpful if, if you find it necessary to come in the room or leave the room during the lecture. It would be helpful if you do it through that door. Because if you walk in front of that camera, it screws up the, the lighting and it does nasty flashy things and has trouble recalibrating itself for a minute. So, or else duck under the camera. OK. We're going to talk about vectors, a way of dealing with the world in three dimensions. Um, when we want to talk about where something is in the world, we can sometimes be sort of sloppy and say, well, it's over there. I can just point at it to the right. But sometimes we actually need a more precise way of, of locating things. And one way to do it that you're familiar with is to use a Cartesian coordinate system where there's an origin. And then you can give coordinates of something with respect to an origin. And you've probably done it in two dimensions. But we're going to do it in three dimensions because the world is three dimensional. And so we need to establish an origin to find some things. So this is going to be our origin for tonight. This is 0, 0, 0 in a Cartesian coordinate system. And by default, unless we specify otherwise, we'll use a coordinate system that works the following way. When we have an origin here, it would be nice if the marker worked. When we have an origin, we will have the positive x-axis running to the right from the origin and the positive y-axis running up. And that leaves one more axis, which is the z-axis. And the z-axis comes, according to this, comes straight out of the board toward you. So I'm going to draw it like this, but it's really out of the board. So from our origin, the positive x-axis runs this way, and the positive y-axis runs this way, and the positive z-axis runs out toward you. This is called a right-handed coordinate system because if you take your right hand and you hold up your first thumb and your first two fingers at right angles, 
you find that if you start counting with your thumb, that's 1, that's the x-axis, the y-axis is 2, and the z-axis is 3. And if you used your left hand, you'd get a different orientation. We always use a, a right-handed coordinate system in physics. That's the convention we've all chosen to use. So let's find the position of something with respect to this origin. So let's take the upper right-hand corner of this projection screen. Uh, right, sort of where the, the arrow is. And we're going to write the location of this in 3D coordinates. But we're going to make it a vector. A vector specifies both uh, it specifies a position relative to something. So in this case, it's relative to the origin. And what we're doing, it's as if we're taking an arrow and sticking its tail here and then stretching it so its tip hit that little white cursor on the screen. And this arrow is going to be a vector. So we're going to call it R, vector. This little arrow over a letter means that it's a vector. And the vector has an x component, a y component, and a z component. And so let's see if we can figure out approximately what the x, y, and z components of this vector ought to be. So let's see. I'm going to move my origin slightly here. OK. So x. Here's a meter. There's a meter. About two meters, huh? Two meters. So, so we should write a two here, but that's not quite right. What's wrong with it? It should be negative, shouldn't it? Because the positive x-axis goes this way. We went in the negative x-direction, so it's negative two meters. OK. Now, a y displacement. So one, almost two meters, not quite, huh? We'll call it two. <coughs> what about z? It's going to be negative, isn't it? Negative one. Negative 1. Now we're not being very precise here, but this is the basic idea. And what we've done is this is written here. It has an arrow over it, so it's a vector. It's enclosed in these little angle brackets saying this is a vector. And the vector has three components, an x component, a y component, a z component. And it says that if you started here, and you tried to walk to that location, you'd have to walk negative 2 meters in the x direction, 2 meters in the y direction, negative 1 meter in the z direction. We could draw an arrow that went there. And in fact, um, we often do, I should have started this before. We often do uh, actually draw an arrow to represent a vector. It's pretty hard to draw in three dimensions on a two-dimensional board. And I'm not going to try, but basically, if I could, we would have drawn an arrow that went positive y, negative x, and then back into the board in the, the z direction. We will not ask you to draw three-dimensional arrows on two-dimensional surfaces. We will allow you to use a computer programming environment called vPython to represent things in 3D. And I'll show you one of those a little bit later. So this is a vector r. It goes from the origin to the top of the screen. There's some, it doesn't tell us, though, how far it is from here to there, does it? Or does it? How would I figure out how far it is going in a straight line from here to there? 
Got to take the magnitude of the vector. And how would I do that? Yeah, it's the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions instead of two. So we write the magnitude of a vector as the square root of negative 2 squared plus 2 squared plus a negative 1 squared meters. So that's a 4, and that's a 4, and that's an 8, and that's a 9. The square root of 9 seems to be 3. So it looks like the magnitude of R is 3 meters. Seems plausible, not unreasonable. So this is called the magnitude of a vector. When we're talking about a vector that's just representing a displacement from an origin, the magnitude of the vector is simple. It's just the distance. Uh, there are a lot of other quality quantities that are vectors, like velocity. And the magnitude of a velocity vector is going to turn out to be speed. We'll see that in a minute. Notice that this number, this quantity, is quite different from this quantity in an important way. This vector r has three components. This magnitude of r is just one number, and that's called a scalar. Whereas this is a vector. In your own work, when you're writing out things on paper, it's actually important to put the arrow over vectors because it's amazingly easy to get confused and start treating them as scalars if you don't. So this is a notational hygiene uh, issue that's actually a, a good idea to pay attention to. OK, suppose we wanted to find a vector in the same direction as our vector r, but only half as long. It actually only ha went halfway. How would we do that? What vector would that be? Well, it's not going to be a unit vector, because a unit vector is a special vector whose magnitude is 1. And since the magnitude of r is 3, we want to scale it, don't we? We just want to shrink it. And the way we do that is we multiply the vector by a scalar. That's why it's called a scalar. It can, so this number can, can shrink or stretch the vector. So a new vector, we'll call it r sub 2. We want it to be half as long. So what if we just multiplied it by a half? Let's try that. So we write a half here, and then we'll write our vector r, negative 2, 2, negative 1 meters. Now this is a legal thing to do. You can multiply a vector by a scalar, because the scalar is just going to stretch it or expand it, or we'll see. Now how does this work, do you think? We're multiplying this vector by this scalar a half. It turns out that what we do is we're going to multiply each component by the half. So we're going to get a vector that's negative 2 over 2, 2 over 2, negative 1 over 2 meters. And so that's going to come out to negative 1, 1, negative 0 0.5 meters. And that's a vector that starts here and goes in that direction, but only gets halfway. Now, we said it was going to be half as long. How do we check to find out if it's really half as long? Take the magnitude. So let's do that. So the magnitude of R2 is the square root of negative 1 squared plus 1 squared plus negative 0.5 squared. What does that come out to? OK, you should bring a calculator to every class. If it's not something you can do in your head, you need to be able to do it. So at every class, you should have a clicker and a calculator. So what's the answer? <laughs> 
three halves. Let's do it in decimals just because we're going to be 1.5. So that comes out to 1.5 meters, and indeed, it's half as long. So it looks like multiplying a vector by the scalar 1 half shrinks it by a half. If we wanted to make the vector twice as long, what would we do? Multiply by 2. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, somebody said unit vector. And the next question is, suppose we want a vector that's pointing in this direction. Uh, oh, before we get to a unit vector, what if we want a vector that instead of starting here and pointing to there, it starts there and points to here. Okay, so it's it's like our vector r, but it's the opposite direction. Multiply by negative one, wouldn't we? So let's see how that works. So we call this uh, we can call this vector q, and it's going to be equal to minus one times our vector r, which is going to be minus one times negative 2, 2, negative 1 meters. And that's going to come out to negative 1 times 2 is positive 2, negative 2, positive 1 meters. And let's see if that makes sense. That says that it's going plus 2 meters in the x direction, negative 2 meters in the y direction, plus one meter in the z direction. So that's right. Points. So we can, multiplying by a scalar can do two things. It can stretch the vector or shrink it. It can actually change its direction, make it go the other way, but it can't rotate it. It can't change the angle. Okay, so it can make it longer or shorter, it can flip it, but it can't change the angle. Multiplying by a scalar doesn't change the angle. Okay, um, suppose now we wanted uh, what we call a unit vector, which is a useful thing. It's a vector that has that points in a particular direction that we're interested in, but its magnitude is 1, its length is 1. These are useful because you can write any vector as a product of the magnitude times the unit vector. So we can write our vector r, and this is going to be our goal. We're going to write it as the scalar, the magnitude of r, which we know is 3 meters because we figured that out, times a unit vector. And unit vectors are so special we write them differently. We write r with this circumflex over it. And this is... This is pronounced R hat. You say we have a hat over it. It's a unit vector, and its magnitude is 1. So we know R. We know that R is negative 2 to uh, negative 1 meters. And so we need to find this unit vector r hat. Now, vectors actually have their whole a whole algebra of their own. Okay, there there are operations that are legal for vectors and operations that aren't legal for vectors. We already know one thing you can do to vectors, you can multiply by a scalar or divide by a scalar, same thing. You cannot divide by a vector. It's just not a defined operation. Uh, but we're in luck here because this is a scalar, and we know we can divide by a scalar. So we can actually rewrite this equation. We can write r is equal to, um, let's get rid of this. We don't need it for now. r is equal to the magnitude of r times r hat, this thing we want to find. 
this is a scalar, so we can divide both sides of our equation by it, and so we get r is divided by the magnitude of r gives us this magical unit vector r hat. Let's see what this comes out to in our case. We've got uh, r, that's negative 2, 2, negative 1 meters. The magnitude of r we found to be 3 meters. So again, when we either multiply or divide by a scalar, every component gets multiplied or divided by the scalar. So this is going to give us negative 2 thirds, 2 thirds, negative 1 third. Or if we work this out, and uh, it's not meters, though, is it? That's kind of interesting. We do algebra with units the same way we do algebra with numbers. And we've got meters in the numerator and meters in the denominator, so they cancel out. So it turns out a unit vector has no units. And if we write it out in decimals, we get about a minus 0 0.667, 0 0.667, negative point. 3, 3, 3. So that looks like the unit vector for the vector r hat. So that's r hat, the unit vector for our vector r. And it starts there and goes like that. So that's, that's the vector. You may have noticed that we're working in S, what we call SI units, Système International. We'll be doing that all semester. The units are... Uh, a meter is the, the unit of length. So everything's expressed in terms of meters or kilometers or centimeters or nanometers. Or We have kilogram as the unit of mass. The second is the unit of time. And the unit of electric charge uh, is the Coulomb, abbreviated C. And we'll get to that in a couple chapters. Okay, since some of you have clickers, let's actually try a clicker question. Here is here's our first question. Here's a bunch of arrows. And the question is, which of these arrows represents the vector negative 4, 2, 0? Now, again, by default, the coordinate system has plus x running to the right, plus y running up. If this this plane is the z equals 0 plane, so we're talking about z equals 0 here. OK, typically we'll have, it depends on how hard the question is, typically we'll have 30 seconds, sometimes a minute if you have to do some calculations. We have 10 responses. You've had time to think about what you think the answer is, so I'll stop the polling. And we get a histogram of the responses. And it's a little bit big. Let's see if we can make it just a little bit smaller. There we go. So it says that 70% of the people in the class answered 2, and 30% answered 4. 2 is B, and 4 is D. B is the most popular answer. Let's see if we what we think that's right. So D. OK, so remember a vector goes from somewhere to somewhere. And so let's start at the tail of D and walk toward the tip, because that's what we did over here. We started at the tail. So we walk one, two, three, four units in the, uh-oh, plus x direction. And then we walk two units in the plus y direction. So this vector from tail to tip looks like it's positive 4, positive 2, 0. So that's not the right answer. Let's try uh, B. That was another popular answer. Oh, that was the most popular answer, wasn't it? B was the most popular. OK, so let's try B. One, two, three, 
negative 4, positive 2, B is correct. Great job. You got it right. All right. Um, let's try one more, and this time I'm going to have you actually vote in addition to using clickers here. Let's see. Okay. What's the unit vector in the direction of the vector 3, 5, negative 2? Okay, even if you, again, bring a calculator class, even if you don't have a calculator, you ought to be able to do this one on paper. Think about how you find a unit vector. There are two steps to this. Okay, this will take, you'll have about a minute to do it. Although you can't be forced to do these exercises, uh, you're cheating yourself if you don't because it's a chance to actually practice something that's going to be important to make sure that you can do it correctly, uh, to see what things there are to trip over while you're thinking about it. Sometimes everything seems clear until you get to go do the homework and then you suddenly realize Gee, that wasn't as clear as I thought it was. So this is a chance to get it right. You get credit, it, course credit, for participating in this way, for doing these exercises, trying to think about things. Okay, it's a small amount of credit, 3% of your, your grade, but you do get credit for, for participating in doing this calculation. Now I see some of you thinking, hmm, I can rule out the number of these. And that's a legitimate way to approach these, these questions. So this is a situation where you also might want to talk to your neighbor. When we're doing these questions and asking you to think about things, it's completely appropriate. In fact, we encourage you to talk to the person next to you and say, I'm thinking about it this way. This is the answer I'm getting. How are you thinking about it? All right, now we're going to vote. So who thinks it's one? Okay. Who thinks it's two? Three. Four. Wow. Five. Well, that's pretty nearly unanimous. Let's see what the clickers said. Wow, they all said four also. Okay. Well, let's see why you knew this. First of all, you knew it because you actually calculated the magnitude and you divided the vector by its magnitude. Um, but there's some, some sort of giveaways. First of all, the magnitude of a unit vector has to be 1, doesn't it? So if you square all the components and add them up and take the square root, it's got to come out to 1. That's certainly not going to happen if you add 9 and 25 and 4. Square root of that is not 1, so that's not a unit vector. Actually, the square root of 1 plus 1 plus 1, square root of 3 is not 1 either, so that's not a unit vector. So it's looking like for a unit vector, every component has to be less than or equal to 1. If something's greater than 1, it's just not going to come out to be a unit vector. Second, what about the directions of the components? If the original vector has a positive x component, the unit vector better have a positive x component, right? So therefore, because we're going to divide this by the mag, can the magnitude of a vector ever be a negative number? No, can't, can it? So therefore, we're going to divide a vector by a positive number of the signs of the components can't change. So therefore, we better have a positive x component a positive y component, and a negative z component, which is certainly looking like this one. <coughs> this looks like that vector just divided by 10, but is 10 the magnitude of that vector? It's not, is it? So therefore, 4 looks like the answer, and that's correct. So good job.